No matter how much we know about God's word, if we don't apply what we learn, the Bible will never benefit our lives. You know, in James chapter 1, it says that we are to prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. Application should be the goal of Bible study. It is the reason we read it, because as we apply what we learn, we're transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And in this video, we're going to explain how to apply what we learn so we have a transformed life. Stay tuned and we'll dive in. Hi, I'm Molly and I am Nigel from Precept UK. So far we've looked at how to observe the text carefully by asking questions of the text, by marking words and listing what we learn. We've also looked at the importance of context in interpreting scripture. If you haven't seen these videos, click on the link to do so. Today we're going to talk about how to apply what we learn from the Bible to our lives. We can do all the observing and interpreting of scripture that we like, but if we don't get beyond these first two steps, we are simply accumulating knowledge, which can, as the Bible says, puff us up. However, if we apply the scripture correctly, we will be transformed into Christ's image. Application is the embracing of the truth, the doing of God's word. It's either a belief or an action. This is what allows God to work in our lives. And as in previous videos, we're going to be using the same text from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 3. But before we dig into Exodus, we want to give you what you might call a guiding scripture for applying it. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture, that's the Bible, is breathed out or inspired by God and profitable for four things. For teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. Why? so that the man of God or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So here is the key. We should apply the Bible in light of these four things. Firstly, that scripture teaches us, and that could be on a particular subject, such as how to build healthy relationships or teaching us about our unique worth as an individual or how to handle money, or that Jesus is God's son who died and rose again to set us free from sin and so on and so on. Secondly, it reproves us. It exposes wrong thinking or wrong behaviour. I remember a friend of ours saying he always used to get very angry with other people until he saw what the Bible said about anger. The scripture showed him where he was going wrong. Correction is the third thing and is often the most difficult next step. We may know what the Bible teaches and see what is wrong in our behaviour or belief but we may be very reluctant to do what's needed to correct it because that may mean breaking past habits or not doing something that we like or perhaps stopping to think before acting. Often correction comes by simply confessing or forsaking what is wrong. Other times God gives us very definite steps to take. When we apply correction to our actions and attitudes, God will work in us for his good pleasure and joy will also follow obedience. And fourthly, training in righteousness. The Bible shows us which is the right way to go. God has given it to us as a handbook for life. He equips us through teaching, commands, promises, exhortations, warnings, and through his dealing with different characters in the Bible. Scripture has everything we need to meet any and all situations of life so that we may be complete and equipped for every good work. And who doesn't want that? So let's uh, return to our passage in Exodus 17 verses 1 to 3 and see what application we can draw out. We need to remember that the author will have had only one intended meaning for what he wrote, but we may conclude that there are many points of application. So this is what the first one says. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Did you notice in this verse that the congregation journeyed according to the command of the Lord? And yet there was no water for the people to drink. The Lord told them where and when to go and yet it seems he led them straight into a problem. They had no drinking water. Let's ask ourselves a question. Are we prepared to listen to God and obediently go where and when he says, no matter the outcome? 
Or do we need to have all our affairs in order, in this case, bottles of fresh drinking water to hand, uh, before we are prepared to step out in faith and obey him? Could it be that God sometimes commands us to go knowing that we're going to find it to be a hard, difficult place to be, a place where we have a very real need? It is possible to be completely in the will of God and yet also be beset by problems. Let's look at verse 2, which says, Therefore the people quarrelled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? We learn from verse 2 that the people's response to there being no water was to quarrel. They were where God told them to be, and they didn't like it. So they took out their frustration and anger by quarrelling with their leader, Moses. Bear in mind that there were probably about 2 million Israelites so the odds were stacked against Moses in coming out well in this particular quarrel. So let's ask ourselves another question. How do we treat our leaders? Do we take out our frustration and anger on them if we encounter a problem and quarrel with them? Clearly the people of Israel were in a very difficult situation. They had no water to drink, but they took out their complaint by grumbling against Moses rather than looking to the Lord to meet their need. He was, after all, providing fresh bread and meat every day for them to eat. And you can see Exodus chapter 16 for all the details about that. In fact, Moses tells us that their quarrelling was testing the Lord. Now that doesn't sound good. Even two million people against God is a minority. Indeed. So how often do we turn and blame others for the difficult situations that we find ourselves in rather than looking to the Lord for his provision. Maybe the Lord has led us into a difficult situation precisely because he wants us to seek him and to give him an opportunity to demonstrate his glory to us in a new and fresh way. Let's look at verse 3, which says, But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So let's ask ourselves one final question. How often do we carry on grumbling despite being given a chance to stop and ask God for his help? And when we are quarrelling and grumbling, do we take things just that little bit further? You know, Moses had exposed the Israelites' sin and had pointed them to the Lord, but they did not take the opportunity to return to him. In fact, they expanded their demand for water to accuse Moses of attempted murder of themselves, their children and their livestock. So just by way of summarising, when applying scripture to your life, the following questions may be helpful. Firstly, ask yourselves, what does the passage teach? Is it, for instance, a general teaching or specific teaching? Does it only apply to a specific people or a cultural problem of the day or to a certain time in history? Has it been superseded by a broader teaching? Secondly, does the scripture expose any error in my beliefs or behaviour? Is the scripture bringing to light wrong attitudes or motives in my life? What are God's instructions to me as his child? Are there new truths to believe? Any promises I need to embrace? Finally, when we apply scripture, beware of applying modern cultural standards rather than biblical standards. And don't apply scripture out of prejudice from our past or from previous teaching or training. So remember, if we apply the scripture correctly, we'll be transformed into Christ's image. Application is the embracing of the truth, the doing of God's word. It is this process which allows God to work in our lives. Having 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17 in the back of our minds as we read and study scripture will be very helpful as we seek to put God's word into practice. If you would like a more detailed practical study guide to Precept's inductive Bible study method, our recommended resource is Lord Teach Me to Study the Bible in 28 Days, which is available from our website. If this has helped you out, it would help us out greatly if you would like this video and subscribe if you want to find new and engaging ways to study your Bible. So until next time, let's seek to know God deeply and live differently. Mm -hmm.